Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. I'm Heidi Shu, President of the World Affairs Council. On behalf of the Board and the members, it's my pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. I want to, to first of all thank uh, McKenna Long Aldrich, a law firm here in Washington, D.C., for hosting us in their, in their spaces this evening. Tonight, our focus is the changing U.S. Army and preparing for America's future military actions. Our guest is General David G. Perkins, Commander the U.S. Army Training and Doctrine Command, or TRADOC. TRADOC is one of the three organizational commands of the Army, and its mission is to recruit, train, and build the United States Army, design the Army of the future, develop the leadership required for successful application of American military power. The World Affairs Council greatly appreciates the men and women of our military forces who serve America across the world. The Council has been fortunate over the last several years to welcome some of the most distinguished leaders from our nation's military to our neutral, nonpartisan podium. These speakers include General Martin Dempsey, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Colin Powell, former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and former Secretary of State, General James Clapper, the Director of National Intelligence, Admiral Michael Hayden and General Keith Alexander, when they were directors of the National Security Agency, and of course, the Honorable Chuck Hagel, Secretary of Defense. At a time when our world is facing a multitude of challenges, the Council seeks to engage Americans in a better understanding of these issues. We believe it is increasingly important for Americans to educate themselves about America's relationships around the world, about the implications for America's actions or inactions, and to better prepare ourselves and our children for the 21st century environment. General Perkins graduated from the United States Military Academy at West Point and was commissioned a second lieutenant in armor in 1980. He completed Ranger and Airborne schools and then served in, the armor, in armor assignments from platoon leader to battalion and brigade staff positions. His distinguished career included command of the 4th Infantry Division, Fort Carson, from 2011 into 2014, General Perkins was commander of the Combined Arms Center at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. In 2003, General Perkins commanded 2nd Brigade, 3rd Infantry Division during the invasion of Iraq. His unit was the first across the border and first to enter the downtown government areas of Baghdad. General Perkins is featured prominently in the book, Thunder Run, The Armored Strike to Capture Baghdad. He received the Silver Star for his part in that invasion. On March 14, 2014, General Perkins assumed command of TRADOC. Along the way, in, 19, in 1988, he received a Master's of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Michigan, and in 1999, he received a Master's degree from the Naval War College. He is well positioned to take on tonight's topic, the future of the U.S. Army win in a complex world. His title, taken from the U.S. Army Operating Concept, Win in a Complex World 2020-2040, that paper published just weeks ago. Our discussant this evening is Jason Campbell. He is Associate Policy Analyst at the RAND Corporation, where he focuses on issues of international security, counterinsurgency, security force development, and measuring progress in a post-conflict reconstruction. He has an MA degree in International Affairs from Catholic University and is currently working on his PhD from my alma mater, the War Studies Department of King's College, London. General Perkins will take your questions after his presentation and the discussion. Please join me in welcoming General David Perkins. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Well, I really appreciate the chance to come here tonight and speak with you all. And, and have a discussion about how the United States Army is viewing the future and our role in it. And we'll look forward very much to the discussion following this as well as the ability to get questions from the audience. And, and it's very helpful for me to sort of get your insights about aspects of this that may not be clear or things that 
you think may, we may have overlooked or oversimplified. Um, one of the things that Training and Doctrine Command does for the Army, we sort of have one of our bumper stickers, is we are the architect of the Army. We design the Army of the future, and uh, in the process of new, doing that, we sort of describe what the future operating environment is like, and then we try to come to grips with what role the Army has in that, and then determine what capabilities the Army has to have to fulfill its role in the future that we describe. And so at this point in time, our history is very exciting to be doing this as we are uh, coming out of over a decade of war and being introspective, looking in at the Army and saying we want to be informed by our recent multiple years of war, but not captive to them. We want to be informed by them as to what insights they can give us as we look to the future and therefore try to innovate and get out in front of our headlights, so to speak, so that we are always maintaining that advantage that, quite honestly, our nation expects of the United States Army. The way that Training and Doctrine Command does that and the role that we play for the Army is we write our operating concepts uh, for the Army. And that's really our, our first attempt with regards to all of the products that we produce to say, what is it that the Army is going to have to do, we try to describe the future, I tell folks, not predict it, but describe the future, and then describe the role of the Army in that, and then that will lead us to what capabilities. And then from this operating concept drives another series of documents, what we call our warfighting concept, and then specifically our capabilities documents. So this is really the broad initial process of coming sort of to an intellectual visualization of what it is the future is going to look like and what it is the Army does about it. So this is not the end-all and be-all document. I have a number of talks about this, and then people say, well, I read through the whole document, and it doesn't discuss what color the new bayonet's going to be. Uh, eventually, we will get to the color of the new bayonet. That is not the role of this document here, so I need to sort of contextualize that. Shortly after I got into training and doctrine command, uh, General Odiano, Chief of Staff of the Army, uh, met with me and said, you know, we're, we're coming out of over a decade of war. We need to start really putting a lot of emphasis in the future. We need to have a new operating concept and because it's going to drive really the rest of the Army for a number of decades, so you sort of need to get after this. Well, as I always tell folks, life is really all about metrics. You, ha you have to be able to measure what it is you're doing to know if you're going in the right direction and where do you want to go. In my previous assignment before I was here, as uh, the host kindly mentioned, I was out at uh, Fort Lumworth, which is where we write doctrine. And when I showed up out there, General Odano said, we need to, up we need to update our counterinsurgency manual. The infamous counterinsurgency manual that a great warrior, General Petraeus, did when he had that job. It was a New York Times bestseller list, and it was sort of a must-read document. And so it's kind of a heady responsibility to say, take this manual that's been heralded as in some ways revolutionary, if not at least evolutionary, and update it. And he said, in the process of doing that, you need to go out and speak with the original authors to get their insight, what intellectual process did they go through, and, and kind of lessons learned in, in writing this. So I said, Roger, that, sir, I'll do it. So uh, General Petraeus at the time was CIA, was very kind, came down to Leavenworth, spent a whole day, we had a conference. He talked about all the processes, both intellectual and physical, that they went through and writing the manual, and went out to other author, author, authors, got their input. About six months later, I went back to Chief of Staff of the Army, said, hey, sir, we're looking at this. I have a new vision of how we want to do the manual. We want to change a little bits and pieces of it. And he says, okay. He said, you, did you talk to the original authors? And I said, yes, sir, just like you told me to. He said, well, did you talk to all of them? I said, well, I think so. I said, in fact, so far, I've spoken with 100 of the five original authors of that document. <laughs> Um, and so that actually became the new metric, I said, and therefore the metric for success of the one that I'm writing is if I can get at least 100 people to claim they wrote it, it will at least be as good as the one that we have right now. So again, life is all about metrics. And so when I got tasked uh, to have Tradoc write the new Army operating concept, I said, well, let me talk to folks who have written one of these before and get feedback. So I talked to retired Chiefs of Staff of the Army, former TRADOC commanders who had been involved in this, and then would go out and talk to captains and majors and colonels and command sergeant majors and, and said, you know, what does right look like? So I, I got an idea in a previous task that I had where right looks. So I said, so what does right look like here? When is the last time the Army had an operating concept that you even remember? 
What's the last one that you remember that drove change, that was foundational to your way of thinking about it? And the unanimous response I got was air land battle. That was the last time the Army sort of had a clear vision of where it was going and it could articulate it and it drove uh, a series of significant changes in the Army from materiel to the way we train to the kind of leaders we develop. So, so air land battle is the metric. They say, Dave, if, if you can do something as half as good as air land battle, then you know, it might be worth your effort. So I said, Roger, I got that. And so being at Tradoc, who authored that, I said, we probably have a copy of it around here. And so I tell folks, hey, you know, send me a copy, send me the digits. Well, um, what they did, first slide, please, they uh, actually brought me a hard copy because apparently back when we wrote this, they actually used paper. And, uh, and in fact, this is a Xerox copy, the hard copy they brought me on, on my desk. And this is uh, one that we all knew and loved as we grew up sort of in, in the height of the Cold War. And it really revolutionized not only the way the Army thought about war, but what kind of material we bought and how we trained our leaders and how we developed them. And so I started reading through this. This is the 86 version. And a couple of things jumped out at me. The first one, you can see the quote that's pulled out of there, is uh, Erlian Val Doctrine really described the Army's approach at the tactical and operational level of war. Now, as most folks know, there's actually three levels uh, of war. There's the tactical, operational, and strategic. You know, I talked to authors of this at the time. They said it was a conscious effort to focus at the tactical and operational level. We were coming out of Vietnam. We had a number of things that weren't quite right in the Army. We were working on that, and they just wanted to bite off a certain amount and focus specifically at the tactical operational level and did not discuss a strategic level of war. So that was a conscious decision. Because an Army operating concept really does three big things for the Army. I tell folks, soon after I got to TRADOC, I found that a lot of people had ideas about the Army, which is good. And so they were always trying to search me out and give me ideas, good ideas. And they would come up with answers. Hey, Dave, you, the Army needs to do this. They need to do this. You know, they'd, you know, see this laser pointer? Th this is, the Army needs lots of laser pointers. They're great. They're shiny. They can fit your fit in your pocket. You press a button, a colored light comes out. They're really great. So if the Army just had more of these, it could point the way for people to follow, and, you, and we would be fine. And somebody else would come and say, no, Dave, you really need one of these. You need these bottles. You can fill them full of water, et cetera. And they'd keep coming to me with what I would call small answers. This is a solution, this is a solution, this is a solution. I would say respectfully, when I write an Army operating concept, I'm not interested in small answers. My job is to ask big questions. And so I've tried to avoid getting roped into buying in to small answers and asking big questions. So the first big question when you write an Army operating concept is, what level of war are you going to build an Army for? That's a, that's a pretty significantly big question. What level of war are you going to build an Army for? because that determines the size of the Army, it determines what it looks like, it determines its capabilities, it determines the material, it determines how you develop people. So that's the first big question. So I would say that's an actually big question. Early in battle, actually, it, it, did, it ended up being a great model because of the intellectual rigor that it went through the analytical process and it asked big questions. First question, again, level of war, Erland Battle said tactical operational level, in fact, explicitly stated it in the manual so as not to have any ambiguity about what we were focusing the Army at. The next thing an Army operating concept has to do is describe the future, describe the environment. Not predict it, but describe it. Well, if you take a look at the picture there that's on the map, this is right out of the manual. Obviously, this manual was written, uh, the first version came out in 82. This is follow-up version, do and approve. It was written at the height of the Cold War. So it was written, actually, for a very specific enemy. It was written for the Soviet Union, a very well-known enemy, an exquisitely well-known enemy. If you take a look at the picture in the book there, it looks eerily similar to the Central Plains of Europe. In fact, if you were standing at the Fulda Gap and looking east, it would probably look very similar to that picture. So it was written for a well-known part of the world. Early in battle, this is not to fight jungle warfare. Okay? This was to fight the Soviet Union on the central plains of Europe. So you have to ask, when you, say, when you describe the environment, is what is the enemy? Very well-known enemy. We knew a lot about the Soviet Union. Where are you going to fight that enemy? On the central plains of Europe. You even have a picture of it. Third thing is, what coalition are you going to fight that enemy with? A very well-known coalition, NATO. 
It was a very well-known coalition that had very well-established tactics, techniques, and procedures. You had STANAGs. You had the NATO Blue Handbook. You had a very well-developed process for decision-making in NATO. It was very clear how decisions were made and who made them and had authority to do it. So when you talk about airland battle and describe the future as, a, as, as the authors then saw it, is described as one with a very well-known enemy to fight in a very well-known place with a very well-known coalition with a very well-known series of tactics, techniques, and procedures. So the way I encapsulate that is airland battle was to deal with the known. You know, in a broad sense, it was to deal with the known. So now we've, a we've answered the two of the three big questions that operating concept does. Again, we're not focusing on small answers, big questions. Level of war that you're going to build an army for and describe the future. The question answered, level of war. In this one, tactical operational, the future is described as known. In other words, we know what we're building this army to do. Then the third thing is, if you do know the level of war that you're building an army for, and in this case, you've described the future of the operating environment, now define the problem. Define the problem that you're trying to solve. Again, when people bring me answers, I always tell them, this may be an answer, but to what problem? Describe the problem to me. Define the problem before you try to sell me an answer. And so actually, again, the authors of Airline Battle did that very well and defined the problem as, next slide, clearly articulated in their manual, is fight outnumbered and win. Actually, this is a very powerful problem statement. For one, it's very clear. Fight outnumbered and win. By defining the problem now based on the echelon of war you're talking about and based on a description of the future, you now can start getting to answers. You can say, well, if I have to fight outnumbered and win, I probably have to have a tank that can maneuver. They can't just fire from a stationary position. I probably have to have a tank that's very accurate. I have to have a tank that's very heavily armored because it's going to have more enemy bullets shot in it that it can return, etc. And so then you start to look at it, you say, you know, I need a very fast tank that can shoot on the move, that is very accurate and heavily armored. And we have an M1 tank, okay? The M1 tank was no accident. It was designed to solve this problem, fight, outnumbered, and win. And then another thing you may say, well, one of the things I have to do is fight, outnumbered, and win is I have to engage uncommitted echelons because we knew a lot about the enemy. We knew the Soviet Union arrayed themselves in echelons. We knew their combat formations. We studied them at length. So we say, I need to be able to engage uncommitted echelons before they commit themselves to the central plains of Europe so I can attrit them. Otherwise, the numbers will not be in my favor. So maybe if I buy a helicopter that can fly deep, that can track and engage multiple targets at once, i.e. an Apache helicopter. Maybe if I buy a multiple launch rocket system that can fire deep and engage the enemy artillery before it's within my range. And so what you see by going through this intellectual construct of defining the level of war that you're building an army for, describing the place that you, in the future that you think it's going to operate in, and then asking yourself, what is the problem I'm trying to solve? It then determines, now I know what kind of weapon systems. I need to have weapon systems that fight outnumbered and win. I could do that by a maneuver. I need to have a doctrine that I'm going to fight throughout the depth of my battle space. I can't wait till I'm just in the close fight. That means I need to have training centers that I can array large formations at so they can fight through the depth of a formation. So we build a national training center out of Fort Irwin. And Dave, we build an opposing force who is built to act just like the Soviet Union. In fact, we make their vehicles look like the Soviet Union. We have visual modifications so they look like T-55 tanks and BMPs. So that, that is the power of an operating concept. If you go through the deliberate intellectual rigor in it, it starts driving all kinds of things in your organization. So when people say, why did you build a national training center? Well, I had to replicate the Soviet Union. Why did you have to replicate the Soviet Union? Because that's what I've defined as the problem. Now, why did you buy an M1 tank? Well, because I have to fight outnumbered and win. Why do you buy an Apache? Why do you have combined arms? Why are you training in combined arms? Well, because to fight outnumbered and win, the helicopters have to fight with the tanks, have to fight with artillery, et cetera, like that. So now it all makes sense. Hey, why at the Command General Staff College, where we send our majors, do you have lots of classes on combined arms? Well, because we're going to give them the vehicles that were built to design the problem that we're trying to solve. So you see how powerful an operating concept is. Airland Battle, if you read the manual, it doesn't say anything about an M1 tank. It doesn't say anything about the National Training Center. What it does is it lays intellectual foundation that then drives you to build those things 
to solve the problem. So that's, again, if you read the operating concept that we just put out, it doesn't say anything about the next bayonet. It doesn't say anything about the next tank. What it does is it describes the level of war, it describes the future, and it posits a problem that we have to solve. Those are the three things the operating concept does. And so we've done that. And so next slide, next bill. Uh, our concept is uh, called unified land operations. Okay, unified land operations. And the problem that we're trying to solve is when in a complex world. And I'll kind of talk you through that fairly quickly. Now, if you'll notice, and any of you are, as I say, are former armor officers out there in the crowd, uh, you'll notice the slide on the left is black and white, and the one on the right is colored. Okay, now, uh, I tell folks that's not merely a slick marketing ploy. It is a slick marketing ploy, but in some ways, it denotes the difference between the world that we fought and that we thought about during the Cold War and the world that we have to think now. What we're saying now is, let's describe the environment. I told you that the future that we built air land battle for in the army that I grew up in, and quite honestly, still have a big part of it. I rode the air land battle formation into Baghdad, and so it has served us quite well over these decades, was what? It was a dis uh, an environment that I described as known. What we're saying, the future that we're gonna have to operate in from now on is unknown. So that's the first question. Because if you build an army to deal with the known, that's a very different army than you build to deal with the unknown. So what we're saying is, I don't know where we're going to fight next. I don't know who the enemy is, and I definitely don't know who the coalition is. So when we take a look at the definition of that word complex, what we're saying complex is describing the future as unknown, unknowable, and constantly changing. So not only is it unknown, but we're saying it is impossible to know. Because I say it's the future is sort of like the Heisenberg principle. The fact of measuring something in and of itself changes it. Well, it's kind of like the future. If you know something about it, you're probably going to do something about it, which means it probably is not going to happen. Because we knew a lot about the Soviet Union, so we did a lot about it, which meant what? We actually never fought on the Central Plains of Europe because our actions precluded the future from becoming that of which we tried to predict. So what we're saying now is we are getting out of the prediction mode in the Army and getting into the description mode. We're going to describe the future. So we, and we have a long list of things, you know, non-nation state actors, transnational this and this. But if you boil it down to what we're saying is the future is unknown and unknowable. So what you don't do is focus on trying to learn an exquisite amount of detail about what's going to happen because that's when you're trying to get into a prediction. What you're trying to do is understand the relationship of all the variables in the world that are acting when you're there. And then the complexity part of it also means constantly changing. The world on the last left was a complicated world. The world on the right is a complex world. The difference between a complicated system and a complex system is a, switch wa a Swiss watch is complicated. Okay. But a complicated system, you can take the back off that switch wa Swiss watch, and eventually you can figure out how it works. You all look at it, and first it looks very complicated. There's springs and gears and all that. But eventually you kind of figure out what this gear does, what that spring does, et cetera. And you can eventually figure it out. And if it's a complicated system, once you figure it out, its outcome is generally predictable, and it is repeatable. In other words, that switch wa Swiss watch is very complicated, but every time you wind it up, it's predictable how it's going to operate. It's predictable, and day after day after day, it generally replicates itself. In a complex organization, you cannot figure it out. It is unknowable. It is un you, you're not going to figure out precisely how it works, and it does not replicate itself. It is constantly changing. So the slide on the left, complicated world. The slide on the right, complex world. Very different problem set that you're going to put an army into. Because on the left, you're trying to get precise value of variables. So there's a lot of variables out there, but you're trying to get a precise value. Give me the exact location of the, uh, of the Soviet Union artillery. Give me the exact location of their second echelon. Give me their exact location of their special forces, folks. You're looking for exact values of variables. The one on the right is 
that is not what you spend your energy on because that is not of much use to you because even if in a moment in time you could find an exact value of a variable, what do we say complex meant? Constantly changing and it's going to change. What you want to do is determine the relationship of the variables. So in a complicated world, you say A equals 1, B equals 2, C equals 3. In a complex world, what you want to know is if A goes up, B goes down. You just want to know the relationship of the variables and is that relationship going to change? When I got into this uh, you know, conflict or whatever it is, whenever A went up, B went down, but all of a sudden something happened and now when A goes up, B's going up. The relationship of the variables change. So you're always looking for a relationship of variables versus an exact value of variables. When we say when, you know, I tell folks what we're focusing on is when. They say, you know, look, that's not for the Army to decide. Definitely not for the trade-off commander to decide. You don't get to decide who wins. I said, really? I, th I thought that was my responsibility as trade-off commander. They said, no, no, that's not you. That's not the Army's. In fact, they said, you know, that takes the senior policymakers of the United States government. In fact, it'll probably even involve policymakers of coalition folks. It may involve uh, interagency folks, State Department, USAID, et cetera, like that. They're all going to have a ver vision of what win means, and it's a kind of, you know, have to coalesce all that together. I said, oh, so what you're saying, that's a strategic thing. Exactly, exactly. You win at the strategic level. Well, that's the other question we answered. This armoring concept is written to deal with the tactical, operational, and strategic level of war. So really, these are the three big questions that this one has answered. Early in battle, operational and tactical level of war. This one is operational, tactical, and strategic level of war. Airland battle, built to deal with the known. This one is to deal with the unknown, unknowable, and constantly changing. The problem we were trying to solve airland battle was fight out number to win. This one is how do we win in a complex world. Now, not only do each of those words have a very specific meaning, but the order of them has a meaning. If you look at airland battle, it said fight out number to win. The implied task is to win, you had to fight. If you look at winning the complex world, we're saying the focus here is winning. The focus is on winning. In fact, you may not have to fight to win, but, big qualifying mark, but, you know, as soon as I say that, people go, I love that idea. Winning without fighting. I said, but, the only way you could possibly win without fighting is it must be absolutely clear to everybody involved that if you do fight, you will absolutely win. So it has to be clear to everybody that if there is a fight, there is no doubt who's going to win. Once you cross that threshold, then you may have a chance to win without fighting. Because a lot of people say, hey, I really like this idea of winning without fighting. I think I'm going to buy that kind of army. I'm going to buy an army that can win without fighting because it sounds cheaper. It can be smaller, etc. like that. I cautioned them. I said, no, you've got it all wrong. If you want an army that can win without fighting, you have to buy an army that can absolutely win the fight. And in fact, it has to be absolutely clear to people. So to, to have an army that can win without fighting may mean that you even need a more capable army than if you only want an army that can fight to win. Because you have to be able to have the deterrence capability and the way you employ that uh, army has to leave no doubt in anybody's mind that you can win any fight, anywhere, anytime, in an unknown world that is unknowable and constantly changing. And once you have an army that can do that, you just may be able to deter people from fighting. So actually, that's a very capable army. So actually, a cheaper army may be able to, well, I better just buy the one that can fight and win. And so a lot of people don't understand the relationship between winning without fighting means you absolutely have to have the capability to win the fight if it comes that way, because that's how you build that deterrence capability. And a lot of people don't understand deterrence capability and what it really takes to have deterrence capability. And it's a full capability, which means intent, it means capability of weapon systems, it means capability to sustain yourselves, to project yourself strategically. That is a very large and um, all-encompassing capability to be able to deter conflict. And sometimes deterring conflict is more difficult than actually fighting a conflict. So what does that actually mean for the Army? So if you blow up that slide, what we've said, there's a couple of things that the Army's going to have to do to be able to win in a complex world. And that is, you kind of see them laid out there on the left, one of it is the Army is inherently the foundation for the Joint Force. So we said to win in a complex world is a strategic level aspiration. And so that means that 
the United States Army has to facilitate bringing together all the strategic assets that are available to us as a nation. Now, when you looked at early in battle, since you were focusing at the tactical and operational level, and you were focusing on fighting outnumbered and winning, you were focusing on acquiring enemy targets and engaging them. So it became a targeting exercise. I have more targets coming at me than I have myself, because it's a, it's a math problem, outnumbered and win. So I focus on acquiring targets and engaging targets. So if you read Air Land Battle, it was about synchronizing firepower. How do you synchronize firepower? When in a complex world, what we're saying is synchronizing firepower in and of itself is inadequate. What we're saying the Army has to do now, if you want to win at the strategic level, we can't only synchronize and deliver firepower, we have to synchronize and deliver national power. Okay, national power is much larger than firepower. Firepower is part of it, but national power means can you deliver economic capability? Can you enable diplomatic capability? Can you enable coalition members? Can you enable all of the instruments of United States national power to be able to focus and win at the strategic level? So now you say, you know what? I have, my staffs have to be different. I have to have different kinds of people on a division staff because now they can't not only know about artillery and infantrymen, but they have to know about diplomatic activity. They have to know about economic activity. They have to know about cultural activity. They have to know how our coalition partners operate. You know, if I send a brigade to Western Africa and deal with Ebola, they might have to know how to work with the World Health Organization. They may have to know how to work with the United Nations. And so when you take a look at this picture, not only is it colored, but you can see it has all domains, the maritime domain, the air domain, space domain, cyber domain, and land domain, international partners, special operating forces, UNHCR, Marine Corps, Navy, Air Force, mountainous terrain, planes, littoral. It is all of the domains intersecting each other. When you looked at air land battle, it was all about the land domain. And then when you talked about air, it was about what does air do to land? So it really was that. What we're saying is, because in, in most of the, the time that I grew up and in the conflicts I was in, the air and sea were uncontested, really. And actually, we'd love to keep it that way. We, in the Army, we want to absolutely make sure the United States Air Force has air supremacy, at least wherever I am, okay? I like that, okay? We want to make sure the United States Navy has absolute naval supremacy wherever they are. We want to make sure the United States Marine Corps has absolute supremacy wherever they're responding to a crisis. That, 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 those are all given. So th this is a very joint doc document, and we, and we want all those guys and gals to kind of really do their part as well. But what is happening now as we move to the future is those domains which were previously uncontested are becoming more and more contested which means that we no, we no longer have the luxury of those other domains being uncontested space, and then they can just deliver effects on land. What we're saying, those of us who operate on land, we may have to deliver effects into those other domains. We, have to, we may have to do something from land to secure the security of the littorals for the United States Navy. We may have to do something in the space domain for ballistic missile defense or for ADA systems for our Air Force brethren. So it's no longer all about land, because the early in battle really was all about land. This is about what does land do to synchronize and deliver all elements of national power in all domains. Another point that I'll bring up there is the ability for us to present multiple dilemmas to the enemy, because that's what you have to do in a strategic level endeavor. And if you are chess players, if you, to put somebody in checkmate, means that they still may have some moves available, but wherever they move, you, you have something for them. In other words, they can't move anywhere without you being able to counter their move. You can't just have a single dilemma. You have to have multiple dilemmas. If you're at the tactical and operational level, you generally present single dilemmas in that, if you looked on the previous slide, I have my main body of tanks and Bradleys, and so I have one dilemma for you to deal with that main body. If you can somehow mitigate that, then you sort of have freedom of action. But we say at the strategic level, if you want to win at the strategic level, there could be nowhere there are enemy turns that, that they are not contested. That's why we have to deliver all elements of national power. That's why if all you can do is target somebody, if that's all you can do is target somebody, eventually they will stop presenting themselves as targets. And so you may be able to influence them at the tactical level, but you can't influence and compel their activity without their 
compliance at the strategic level unless you can stop every move they have and present them with these multiple dilemmas. And then you can see down there, again, integrate partners. This is a part of us being a member of the joint force. And then at the end, consolidate gains. When you operate in a tactical and operational level, you get effects there. But if you want to win at the strategic level, you have effects. You've got to array them in time and space and, co and consolidate them to give you sustainable political outcomes. Because that's what war is about. That's how you win at the strategic level, very Clausewitzian in nature, that war is an extension by politics of other means. In other words, really, quite honestly, the reason the United States goes to war is to gain some type of sustainable political outcome in the favor of our national interest. Well, we're saying uh, most of that occurs on land. So what we have to do is not only provide a tactical and operational effect, we have to be able to consolidate all of those gains and all of those gains of national power, economic, political, coalition partner, into sustainable political gains for the United States, or why do it in the first place? You, you may feel good about yourself to get a momentary tactical effect, but if you can't translate that into a sustainable political outcome that you're, that you're focused on in the long term, and what we're saying is you are coming up short with regards to really what we think an army is for. Because what we're saying for the future, the army is to win in a complex world, win at the strategic level by delivering all elements of national power in an unknown, unknowable, and constantly changing world. And so I think at this point, we're gonna to transition to, I guess, a discussion, then Q&A. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as Ms. Shoup said at the outset, my name is Jason Campbell. I'm with the RAND Corporation here in Washington, and I will uh, serve as this evening's discussant. Uh, the way we'll proceed here is uh, General Perkins and I will, will uh, engage in a, about a 15-minute conversation, and that should leave about 20 minutes for uh, Q&A from the audience. Um, so with that, uh, sir, thank you for, for your remarks uh, and, and for the, the uh, uh, keeping the PowerPoint to a minimum. Three slides is... is, is uh, uh, and most of them were pictures. That's right. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was excellent, excellent uh, correct use of, of PowerPoint slides there. Um, and sir, in reading through the, the latest uh, operating uh, concept, um, I, I think you accurately uh, sort of get at all of these unknowns we're dealing with going forward here, uh, be it the environment, the enemy, the coalitions we'll be working with. Um, given all of these unknowns, how difficult is it to articulate uh, a clear strategic vision going forward, particularly when you have to incorporate all of these other entities that, that perhaps didn't have to, to be part of the deliberations in the past? Yeah, I, you know, it's very complex, right? Sure. Um, one of the things, and, and it's, you know, why we uh, actually thought a while about this, the words we put in there, when in a complex world, is that, is that you, from the very beginning, you have to get into this discussion of winning, which is very difficult, uh, because, it, you know, define that, draw a picture of it, what does it look like, et cetera, and it involves multiple people. I mean, and if you look back at previous conflicts, World War II, even World War I, you had coalition partners that each had a different view of what winning looked like. If you read uh, history and memoirs of Abraham Lincoln, he, his vision of winning in the Civil War changed multiple times during the fighting of the Civil War. But he always had a long-term strategic look of an outcome that was sustainable for a long time. And so what we're saying is that that is critical because what it does, first of all, it forces these very tough discussions, like you say, that there is no exact answer and it's probably going to change because your coalition will change um, maybe some of the outcomes that are within the realm of the possible change. People may switch sides. People has a, have a change of heart. But if you always stay at that level, what it does is it provides a basis of understanding of what you're trying to do in the long term. And therefore, when you have discussions about a short-term problem, a lot of times if you don't have that long-term view of what are we trying to get and, and is it sustainable, a lot of times we are very clear in there, we talk about sustainable gains, sustainable outcome, that people will have a view of the end state, but when you think about it, you say, I don't think that's really sustainable, is it? And so you, it makes you grade your own homework, and then you say, you know, I probably have to do things differently. Uh, when I was a division commander in Iraq, we were the last division up north and, um, at that time, and uh, there were, you know, a lot of issues, the Kurds and the Arabs and various things like that. And I would go around to my battalion and brigade commanders and say, well, what's going on? What are you doing? Like, 
well, sir, we've done this. We've established this combined security mechanism, and, and my unit's in the middle of it all. And whenever there's an argument, they come see me, and I figure it out, and people go back to the corner and everything like that. And I said, yeah, but that's, that's not sustainable because you're not going to be here forever. So how are you working yourself out of the picture? In fact, you're the, you're the last commander here. So what I need you to do from now on when I come up here is you need to brief me on how you are making yourself irrelevant. Well, that's generally not the way we look at things. Army officers are kind of type A people, so we generally in the Army have a solution of which we are the center of gravity. That's why we're there. If I'm irrelevant, why should I be there? Well, maybe you are there to build a sustainable process that as you fade out, they can continue on. And that's why winning at the strategic level is imperative to keep it at the forefront. Otherwise, you will sub-optimize what you're doing for a temporary tactical and operational gain. Great. Now, sir, the next steps for this, I know this is sort of the big picture, you know, top document. Right. Given all the complexity, do you see this feeding down into many different sort of uh, branches here? And is there any, I don't want to say concern, but is there any feeling that this might get, you know, as we, you know, with all these unknowns, there's going to be any number of scenarios we can plan for right. or discuss or talk about or war game. Um, has that come up at all as far as, okay, at some point we're going to have to try to... You actually have to do something. Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, that's exactly what this is meant to do. So in many ways, this lays out what I sort of call the first order principles. The broad intellectual foundation about what we think the future is going to look like and what the Army does about it. Now what we're focusing on is specific capabilities we have that we think are going to be useful in the kind of environment that we're describing, not predicting, describing. So there, what we have are these universal things that we think we can be pretty well assured is going to happen. One of them is with our capabilities at technology, the enemy generally tries to do a number of things. One, they try to emulate them. So we have unmanned vehicle, aerial vehicles. They have unmanned aerial systems. We have robotic systems. They have robotic systems. We have submarines. They have submarines. So one of the things we find happens quite routinely because the United States generally is in the forefront when it comes to military capability is we can no longer assume that we are the only ones that are going to have it, that the enemy is going to emulate us. When I grew up, we had equipment that nobody else had. So we had night vision goggles. The enemy didn't. They just didn't have them. So that provided us the ability to fight at night. So I had 12 more hours of fighting than the enemy, hence allowed me to fight out number to win because I had 12 more hours of the day I can fight. What we're saying in the future, as we describe it, that gap in technology is going to get less and less and less because they're going to emulate what we have. So I'm going to have night vision goggles. They're going to have night vision goggles. Now the issue is how do I use mine better? How do I train and develop my soldiers to use the technology, which actually may be the very same as my enemy? Under alien battle, it was create a huge differentiation in technology. What we're saying in the future, what you need to do is increase your rate of innovation. You can't count on differentiation. So now what we're saying is, what are these capabilities the enemy is going to do? They are going to emulate us. They are going to avoid our strengths. So if we are very good at targeting people, they will stop presenting themselves as targets. Okay? If we are very good at conducting large combined arms maneuver in the middle of the desert with tanks, they will avoid fighting us in the middle of the desert with tanks. They will avoid our strengths. They will stop becoming targets, so they will meld into the population. They will go underground. In other words, they are avoiding our strengths. So we can say whatever strength we come up with, I can pick it. They will tend to avoid it and or emulate it. So now we are now going to run war games and say, well, how do you deal with an enemy that is emulating your technology? They know that what we like to do is come in with a lot of stuff and build up a big base of support and then launch off. So what are they going to try to do? Deny us access. They will try to deny us access from ports, deny us access from airfields, deny us access from the air domain, deny us access from the cyber domain. So we know now in the future, however I try to gain access, they are going to try to deny access while avoiding our strengths and emulating our capabilities. So now I have to run a war game and say, how do I get access while I am actively trying to be denied access, at the same time the enemy is avoiding my strengths and emulating my capability. So, but see, it's all based on this broad intellectual 
background trying to describe the future. In other words, it's not this country at this grid square so like this. It's broad capabilities. Now I, an army, have to say I need to have capabilities to operate in this environment. So we have 20, what we've called for this year, 20 first order things that we are looking at. We're going to do five a quarter. One of it is uh, how do we gain access when people are trying to deny it to us. Another one is how do I optimize soldier and team performance. How do I take the, the most expensive and most capable weapon system in the United States Army inventory, the soldier. This is our smart weapon system. How do I take this weapon system and make it more capable? Can I increase its cognitive capability? Can I, can I increase the way that it operates as a part of a team? Can I increase the interface between my soldier and their technology so that they can innovate quicker than the enemy soldier and their technology? So we are looking at defining very specific capabilities that we think are applicable. Because a lot of people think, well, you're just taking a buy. You're just saying the future's unknown, so I can't do anything about it. No, it's, it's very critical to say, if you think you're going to deal with an unknown world, there's actually a lot of things you can do to be very good at dealing with unknown situations. Well, thank you, sir. And uh, with that, uh, that uh, pretty much will conclude my uh, questions here. Uh, we've got a microphone set up here in the center of the room. If anybody in the audience would, would like to ask a question of General Perkins. Good evening, sir. Uh, my doing? name is Lieutenant Jason Camerata. I work on the OPNAV staff. Well, I wanted to ask you, um, obviously it's no secret that the Navy has a great operational focus on the Western Pacific, on the yeah. East and South China Sea, and the proverbial pivot to Asia. I wanted to ask you, uh, in your opinion, what role do you see the Army having in Asia, and also uh, how are you shaping the Army to operate in an environment that's vastly different than Mesopotamia, vastly different than the Fold Gap, and primarily a littoral maritime environment? Yeah, you know, we have the, the sort of the infamous pivot uh, to the Pacific. Now, the one thing, just to clarify a lot, a lot of people, when they think about the Pacific, they don't necessarily think about the Army. I mean, they think about the Marines and the Navy, et cetera, like that. But, but even before the Pacific pivot occurred, uh, we had well over 60,000 soldiers operating the Pacific. So there's a lot of activity already going on. One of the things we think the Army is uniquely suited for in the Pacific, and General Brooks is now the U.S. Army Pacific Commanders, which was previously a three-star position, is now a four-star position. Uh, so I told my uh, great West Point classmate there that he kind of won the lottery because not only is he the first four-star Army guy to have that, but he gets to work in Hawaii. So, you know, uh, he, he lives a good life. Um, is that the Army sets the theater. We, what we, we have core competencies that we say the Army does uniquely for the Joint Force. One of them is we set the theater generally from a logistical point of view. So, for instance, the Army provides most of the network connectivity for the Joint Force in the Pacific already. We provide a lot of the logistical background, medical background, things like that. I know General Brooks spends a lot of time uh, with his counterparts in the Pacific because the vast majority, over 90% of their chiefs of defense in the Pacific are Army, that's the branch they are in of their nation. So that is the likely uh, person to work with because they, they, you know, navies are very expensive to have, as the CNO continually reminds us. Uh, so navies are very expensive to have. Air forces are very expensive to have. And so a lot of nations don't have robust navies and air forces, but almost every nation has an army whether it's for internal uh, reasons or to protect it from external uh, threats. And so there is, that is always, in many cases, the first point of entry for theater security cooperation and building mill-to-mill -mill relationships. And so in a macro sense, we don't see our role any different because what we were very clear when we wrote this Army operating concept is we said we wanted to maintain clarity on the consistency of the nature of war while taking into account the changing characteristics of war. So there are some eternal uh, natures of war that stay constant while the characteristics, technology, location, et cetera, like that, can change. Consistencies are war is, by definition, a human endeavor. That is what war is. It's about a human endeavor. You are trying to compel activity of humans, generally on land in the end, as your sustainable political goal. And it's a contest of wills. War is a contest of wills. Who, can, who has the most will and can stay at it the longest till somebody sort of, com, uh, you know, is, their actions are compelled one way or the other. And so we think that is no different in the Pacific than anywhere else. The Pacific is characterized by large distances. 
not necessarily contiguous land masses. So if you look at defending the central plains of Europe, that was generally a contiguous land mass. So if you take a look at our diagram there, you can say one of the things we have to do now is we have to design and build an army that can operate in non-contiguous environments. Non-contiguous environments yet can provide some level of effect as you would expect is if it was operating in a contiguous environment. So in many ways, the things we're looking at for unified land operations are very much in need in the Pacific. That we are is very much a joint force because a large distance is air, uh, maritime, and land. And then our ability to provide that foundational capability, the ability to operate in non-contiguous environments and develop the whole of national power, it's really sort of the Pacific is almost custom made for our view of, of what we think we have to have here. So great question. Thanks, sir. My question kind of goes more towards the collaboration um, uh, between international development and you know post-conflict almost. Right. Uh, well, I mean, that's there's, there's a vague term, but. It, yeah, um, <laughs> exactly. Well, I've tried, I've gotten away sort of from differentiating what phase are we in and is this, this, it just kind of all meshes <laughs> together after a while just because one bad nightmare. Yeah, so I guess my question is, where do you see um, the most gains being had between collaboration between, you know, agencies like USAID or something like that and, and DOD or the Army and kind of those uh, relationships for the future and what we do? And like you said, the sustainability, and that's something yeah. we need to get better at, unfortunately. Well, I definitely am a big fan of getting left to the boom, as we say. Uh, and so it really begins, as a great mentor of most of us in the Army, General Sullivan says, the intellectual leads the physical. And so getting this intellectual part of it, so what we do out of Command General Staff College, which is uh, the job I had before I came here, uh, we are working very hard to get interagency people and interagency person in every staff group we have of Army majors. Right now we have uh, uh, all the services, so there's a sea service person, an air service person, uh, there's generally an international officer. We're trying to get an interagency person in there. So at that, starting at that level, our young field grades and the interagency folks, people are starting to have the dialogue and understand how all of national power works because what we're saying is the Army can no longer focus on synchronizing firepower. When I went to the Command General Staff College, the only people in your staff group were Army officers, okay? So they were Army officers and you spent all your time synchronizing firepower. If you go to Command General Staff College now, every seminar has an international officer, some have two. We try to have an interagency inter person in each one of them. Uh, and we, um, have a joint, all of the joint services representative because we're saying it's about our young majors learning how to synchronize national power. You can't, you can't wait and do it at the conflict. It, it's just too, you, you could try hard at it and you can get some success, but, you, but you've really missed all the preliminary part of it because a lot of the success that you need during those periods you're talking about, you really have to set the foundation early on. You really have to set it early on. You know, the example that I use, again, using myself as hopefully a learning organization. So when I went into Baghdad as a brigade commander, if I said, you know what, I, it, we may be here a couple of months, okay? We may be here a while, so maybe I ought to think twice before I bomb a bridge and take it down. Maybe I ought to think twice before I bomb a power plant to take out the lights, because that gives me a momentary advantage that I've taken out the lights so the enemy can't see me, but now it could take years to rebuild it, and in fact, I may own the rebuilding of it. So you've got to think through this before you cross the line of departure, because what you do tactically, if it's not informed by a strategic vision, you could do things that you will later regret. And I did a lot of things that I later regretted, because then all of a sudden, you know, uh, you get your just desserts. You know what Colonel Perkins did? General Perkins, your job is to fix it. Uh, good evening, sir. My name is Leo Cruz, and I'm a defense fellow in OSD. And uh, the question I have is looking at sequestration coming ahead yeah. and General Ordierno obviously looking at the size of the yeah. Army. Uh, with looking at what you suggested in, in uh, earlier in this talk about how looking at the strategic deterrence of a standing Army mm -hmm. and whether or not we have the forces and the numbers to do a strategic deterrence, you know, is that a large army yeah. or is it a more capable army to do all the great things that you've suggested in the operating? Well, one thing, we'll, we'll take, one, take the last we'll question. Okay, double barrel. Let you, yeah. uh, okay. okay, thank you. Uh, Abraham Abadal, retired uh, Foreign Service, also served. Uh, thank you so much for your interesting, thoughtful presentation, uh, General Perkins. Uh, Napoleon's the most uh, important strateg strategic advice was when your enemy makes a mistake, don't disturb him. Right. Uh, 
Right. So, uh, with that in mind, to what extent the Army is capable of taking advantage of, uh, through intelligence and counterintelligence, of enemy, enemy mistakes uh, to, to perform, to better perform and uh, accomplish objectives? Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, two great questions. I'll, I'll mesh a bit of one answer. The first one, that comes up a lot, you know, sequestration, budget, et cetera, like that. If you read through this document, this explicitly was not designed to be a force sizing construct. You're not going to see the word POM or budget or sequestration or anything like that. Just like if you read 100-5, it is budget immaterial. In fact, and this question came up in a previous forum I was at, a lot of folks say, well, this is very ambitious. Are you going to have enough money to do it? In other words, if you don't have money, enough money to do it, then why would you even put out this document? I tell folks, it's just the opposite. When you have a lot of money, sometimes a vision and priorities are less important because you have so much money, you can almost waste it and just throw enough of it out there and eventually get it. But when you have less money, you definitely better have a vision of what you want to do with it, and you definitely better have priorities. So in some ways, resource constraints are a forcing function to kind of get your act together to say, do you know what you're for? Do you know what your priorities are? Do you have a way to go about it? Now, what the budget does for us is it large, allows us to build capacity to do this. Can I do this in a small area or a large area? Can I do this three times at once or five times at once? What's the, how much time do I need? Well, I can do it once and I need 10 months off another time. So what budget and size do is it dictates capacity about how often and where you do it. But what we're saying is regardless of the budget and the size, this, these are the capabilities our, our Army has. If we say, well, you only, you're going to have sequestration, so I don't have the money to build an Army that operates jointly or integrates folks in the Joint Force or an Army that focuses strategically. We're saying all the more important. So I try to defor divorce the two. They are related because the budget resources you for capacity to do it, but you still have to have priorities and a focus, which that does. With regards to, sir, what you were talking about, that really gets to the win part. Uh, you know, if you focus on winning, if you say, I have to fight to win, what happens is you may disturb them when they are their own worst enemy because you're just focused on fighting them. If you say, I need to focus on winning at the strategic level, you tend to step back a little bit. You say, you know, are they making a lot of mistakes? And if they are, maybe I'll facilitate their mistakes in a way that's not directly encountering them because that may force them to kind of get their stuff together if I push hard on them. What I'll do is, with all elements of national power, maybe with coalition folks, with indigenous folks, economic, political things, what I'll do is continue to reinforce their mistakes until they get to a part where it is to my strategic advantage. And that's the difference between focusing on winning versus focusing on fighting. Well, sir, thank you for the, the insightful remarks and, and for taking all, all the questions. Um, Ms. Shoup, would you like to include any remarks? Oh, sure, absolutely. I'll just say thank you very much, General. It's been a very informative and interesting evening, and I think we all have learned a lot tonight. And uh, thank you very much, and thank you, Casey. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.